I became one of those people that get into the bomb suit and work on diffusing everything that goes boom from bullets to nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. There was a secondary device that hadn't been detected. It detonated in my face and it took my eyes. It cracked my skull in a few places. It was a long, arduous, frustrating learning period. During the COVID era, when everybody was quarantined, locked down, everyone was complaining about being isolated and lonely and not knowing what to do. Imagine, I was thinking, welcome to my world. Yeah. And learning to deal with these two tragedies is actually amplified my life. It's been a catalyst for my growth. I've learned that every human, we're, you know, wired to avoid discomfort. We hate failure. We don't want to be ridiculed or mocked or judged. We don't want to feel that discomfort and we certainly don't want to feel pain. And what we do is avoid these hardships. And unfortunately, that's handicapping us. Sitting in the hospital bed, learning, just learning for the first time that I'm going to be blind for the rest of my life. And you imagine the emotions that are going through one's mind. I can't do this, I can't do that. I'll never be able to do this again. You know, why me? What if all those demons that creep into your mind? And that was me. I was feeling awful. From the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated, and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Dear friend, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. I am your host, Paddy Dander, and on today's episode, I have someone who is truly inspiring, and I... I'm so excited for this conversation because I'm hoping to learn so much from him. He is deaf, blind, an endurance athlete and entrepreneur. Thank you for joining me today, Aaron Hale, who's all the way from the US. Hey, Aaron. Well, thank you for having me on, Patty. And I do say I'm blind, deaf and quite daft. That makes two of us. Don't worry. So, Aaron, I would really love to hear your story of how you came to be in this situation because I know a little bit about you from reading up on you and hearing your story on other podcasts but could you tell some of the listeners your journey and how is it that today we're going to be talking about a very inspirational topic? Of course. I am a former U.S. military. I started in the, the military as a, a Navy chef that I'd Jump ship, so to speak, and became an army bomb technician, EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. It's the military's bomb squad. And it's a far cry from Navy cooking. But I tell people when I got my first confirmed kill with an egg roll, I decided to start saving lives instead. But the truth is, I joined in a time of peace in 1999 and then soon found myself, like so many of us, in a time of war facing two different enemies in two different lands. And I was, even though I was a part of the big military machine, I was cooking and I loved what I was doing, but I knew that I, my skills and talents and abilities could be put to a better use towards mission success. And that's when I switched uniforms and switched jobs and became an explosives expert. And I became one of those people that get into the bomb suit and work on diffusing those roads, suicide vests, everything that goes boom from bullets to nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. And I was on my third deployment in Afghanistan when working on an IED, an improvised explosive device and roadside bomb. When there was a secondary device that hadn't been detected, it detonated uh, in my face and it took my eyes it cracked my skull in a few places, left me with some cuts and bruises and, and burns, but thankfully alive. 
However, my life was drastically changed. I was, I was plunged into blindness 100%. And I lost some of my hearing at that time, but I hadn't gone completely deaf. It wasn't until four years later after I'd learned how to become a blind person and was making my best at it that the complications from the fractures in my skull came back to haunt me again. And when bacterial meningitis crept into those cracks that we had thought had been patched up, well, the bacteria, that meningitis nearly killed me. And I was in the hospital a second time, four years after the bomb blast. Despite living again, uh, surviving one more time, the bacteria stole what was left of my hearing and left me 100% deaf on top of 100% blind. It wasn't until almost a year later that I was able to hear a little bit again through the uh, advent of a cochlear implant. It's not a, a, a hearing aid. Uh, it doesn't take sound in through the, the ear canal. It takes the sound in, digitizes it, sends it through a magnetized tether to the implant that's inside. And uh, it sends the, that, uh, that digital signal right to the inner, inner ear, the cochlea, and right to the auditory nerve. So it was a long, arduous, frustrating learning period, both times learning how to be blind and learning how to be blind and deaf. And if you can imagine when during the COVID era, when everybody was quarantined, locked down, everyone was complaining about being isolated and lonely and not knowing what to do. Imagine I was thinking, welcome to my world, but you know, I was no stranger to it. Yeah. Learning to deal with these two tragedies is actually amplified my life, accelerated. It's been a catalyst for my growth. Uh, I've become, since, since the injury, I've become a public speaker, podcast host myself, a entrepreneur, real estate investor. I've gotten married, had a, a pair of identical twin uh, toddlers who are now four years old. Well, of course, identical because I shouldn't be the only one who's uh, confused. And I live a rich and, and fulfilling life. Uh, and I'm, in a sense, I'm actually very grateful for the path that I was thrust into. Oh, Aaron, thank you for sharing that personal story. And uh, I just can't even begin to fathom what you've been through. And it's something that I, I think as the listeners are listening as well, we're probably all reflecting on that situation and, you know, being thrust into such devastation and then rising up from that the way you have. And so, Aaron, on this episode, what superpower would you like us to deep dive on? It's harnessing the information from pain. I've learned that every human, we're, you know, wired to avoid discomfort. We hate failure. We, we don't want to be ridiculed or mobbed or judged. We don't want to feel that discomfort and we certainly don't want to feel pain and what we do is avoid these hardships and unfortunately that's handicapping us instead you know having been forced into painful and difficult situations uh, i've learned i've grown and i've actually become appreciative of the hard times of the painful times but pain is chock full of information if we're willing to pay attention and listen. And pain itself is, is a mental construct. It's like a, the smoke detector. It's not the actual fire. So if we listen to pain, if we listen to those emotions, it's, it's going to tell us what we need to know and we can act accordingly. So sitting in the hospital bed, learning just learning for the first time that I'm going to be blind for the rest of my life. And you imagine the emotions that are going through one's mind. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'll never be able to do this again. You know, why me? What if all those demons that creep into your mind? And that was me. I was feeling awful. I was, I was angry. 
and I was sad and I was in mourning for a life of potential that will never be. And I was asking all the wrong questions. And I was saying, I was, I was all that self-talk that was leading me down a road that was a dead end. If I kept saying, I can't do this, or why is this happening to me? Then there's no answer. It's impossible to answer. So you just you go into a, a spiral of despair and, and self-defeat. It's self-limiting. But if you can take a step back and imagine the, and, and listen to the pain, the emotion, and try to separate yourself from the emotion and go to the, the lesson it's trying to teach. So I started changing the questions. Instead of, I, I can't do this, I would say, I can't uh, navigate the world on my own anymore without, you know, someone's help. And now I say, how can I navigate the world? How can I do this? How can I do that? And it opens up a world full of opportunities. I also stopped saying, why is this happening to me? Rather, I would say, why is this happening for me? What can I learn from this? What information can I pull from a certain situation? And that opens up creativity. That opens up imagination. That builds your resilience. And you become far more resourceful. And then every situation in your life becomes less about the pain itself but the experience and the opportunity to grow. So I go on one step further to, from why is this happening to me to why is this happening for me? And then the next step there is why is this happening for me so that I can teach others? And that becomes the greatest strength because if you are always looking to help others, you are living a life of service. And when you are living for something greater than yourself, then everything becomes manageable. Nothing is impossible. And that pain becomes so far diminished that you're not feeling it. This is a physical pain. This is emotional pain. So all this discomfort, it's the catalyst for growth. And in fact, uh, when I find myself being too comfortable, though the warning bells start going off again, I'm becoming stagnant or maybe I'm not doing something I should be because I want to put myself into a perpetual state of discomfort. And that has become my super. And Aaron, again, it is absolutely mind blowing just hearing you talk there and, and just how you've reframed some of that language into a positive, into a more kind of open growth mindset approach. Can you remember the moment where things did start to change in your mind? So you mentioned you were you thinking, I can't. And then all of a sudden you were able to reframe that language. What was the contributing factors that helped you change that mindset? There are so many points where it was just me reframing the situation that made it so much more bearable and sometimes even enjoyable. I remember reading about Vice Admiral James Stockdale and the Stockdale Paradox. Uh, he was in Vietnam POW. He was asked, oh, did you know who would make it and who would not? And he said, of course. It was the, the optimist, which is the paradox there. You mean the, the ones that were just hopeful? Yes. And to explain, he would know when people weren't going to make it because they would say something like, the, the Americans were going to come get us by Christmas and Christmas would come and go and they would just move the date. Okay. So we're going to be rescued by Easter and Easter would come and go. And eventually they would lose hope in rescue. And soon thereafter, they would commit suicide or die. You, you could tell when all of the life had drained out of that positivity, optimism, that hope was gone. And rather it was the ones that could endure were the ones that said that they realized they don't put a, a finish date on it. They had a firm grasp of the reality in front of them with faith in the positive ending. So for me, those transition points were when I was completely deaf, completely blind and sitting at my breakfast bar at home, you know, in my kitchen counter, trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. 
I loved running, but I'd also lost my inner ear balance, my vestibular balance when I lost my hearing. So I came home in a wheelchair. It was pretty desperate. I couldn't even get one to my treadmill because it was like somebody was trying to steal it from under me. So I went back to cooking. I knew that I could still cook. I could still taste and I could still smell. And that positive action, taking a step towards something, keeping myself busy. And I was cooking for Thanksgiving. It was a holiday that I love so much. One, because you get to gather everybody around you for to talk about what you're most grateful for in the world with the people you're most grateful to be around, hopefully. And the second reason is because it's an excuse to eat like an absolute glutton. I started cooking and I remembered everything I, I enjoy about cooking. And then one day after having this thing tuned in a little bit more, I accidentally hit my wooden spoon against the pot while cooking some fudge. And it actually sounded like wood against iron, wood against steel. That clang and that little piece of joy entered my world again. And before I knew it, my, before I knew it, my wife was coming out of the bedroom going, what is all that racket? As I was like a toddler that had gotten into the cabinets playing drums on all of the pots and pans. And I just told her, sweetheart, this sounds like me clanging on pots and pans, just like, I know. And then she realized what I bet. So um, I took joy in a little bit of progress. And that's part of leaning into the pain and being creative, doing activities that you know are small steps. You don't have to take massive change every single time. And then, of course, trying to make all the huge improvements uh, will lead to burnout. All you need is that one percent, one step forward every single day and appreciate the small wins and, you know, live a life of fulfillment. I am a terrible cook, Aaron, so I do envy you. I can just about boil an egg. So let's just put it that way. That's about my extent of my cooking ability. But your life now, could you put it into perspective for us in terms of what does a typical day look like for you? And what are some of the challenges that you've had to overcome just from waking up in the morning through to going to sleep at night? I've had to learn how to face so many challenges, big ones, of course, and even little ones. Imagine trying to pair your socks. So, you know, speaking of cooking, you know, there was definitely a learning curve when it came to learning how to cook all over again when you couldn't see the pot pan or even where the dial on the stovetop was to know the heat. So at first, the fire alarm scared the heck out of my children. Then it became the dinner bell. The smoke alarm was going off. Uh, Dad's done with, with dinner. But my daily routine it starts it's a fairly early, of course, because toddlers, they have no respect for full night sleep, beauty rest. But I also <laughs> appreciate having my own time in the morning. Is the time to get things going. And I truly believe in prioritizing my day and putting the most important things first and getting that out of the way. Three or so of my most important next steps in work, life, and fitness. And I believe in, you know, the decision fatigue. Where we make about 30,000 different decisions from what pair of socks we're going to wear, what pants we're going to put on to should we refinance that house or, you know, partner on the, somebody on the next deal? So I try to take as many of the morning decisions away out, out of my day as possible. So the day before I'll set up my, my clothes for the morning, I'll preset my coffee pot. So I don't even have to decide whether I'm going to turn it on. It's just going to be ready for me. And I just... I try to build it in habit versus routine. I think that's one of those things that people get, it's a kind of a misnomer. I need to get into the habit of working out or I need to get into the habit of eating better. And the difference is habit is something that you can do with regularity without, with little to no thinking or effort. And a routine is something you have discipline in doing. Though it does take some thought and some effort. 
So a lot of things we call habit are really routines. And I want to make my morning routine as much habit as I possibly can. So I don't want to think about it. And the very first thing I want to do is get the most important thing out when I'm at my most fresh. So first, my most important thing in uh, the whole world are my, my children. I get them ready for school, feed them, and that brightens my day. And once the house is nice and quiet again, then I set my most important business activities. Aaron, how old are your children, by the way? Just so you get a view of the level of support you have to give them. I've got uh, a soon-to-be teen, 13 years old, and twin four-year-old boys. All boys. Wow. Okay. So that puts things into perspective for me, because I was assuming maybe you've got one or two kids, but you've got three, and there are very challenging ages. I sympathize. Yeah. So I am a stay-at-home dad with a e-commerce fudge shop and my wife and I are real estate investors with a portfolio in a couple of different states in the U.S. And on top of that, I'm an ultra endurance runner. So I, I run ultra marathons, 100 miles. And I just, just this past July, I became the first blind deaf person to complete the Badwater 135. It's an ultra uh, foot race. It's called the world's toughest foot race across Death Valley and up to the Mount Whitney portal. So 135 miles across Death Valley, three mountain ranges. That's just phenomenal. I mean, that type of challenge, I think even for someone who's fully able-bodied would find extremely challenging. How do you navigate that? Is it a case of using some technology to help you, some support from someone, or is it entirely down to you? Everything in my life has become a team sport. Everything. You know, it, it's very unwise of me to just lace up and step out my front door uh, for a run. So when it comes to running, it's very simple. I use a short tether that a running guide, a sighted guide, a fellow runner, holds on to and I hold on to another end. We've got this little piece of nylon with two loops and I slip a couple fingers in one loop and my guide slips fingers into the other loop and we run side by side almost as though we're holding hands. That's to get all my cues from where that tether goes. Now as a little piece of creativity or inspiration, we learned just two days before Badwater that I would have to run single file for the almost the entire 135 miles. And we had to come up with an entirely new method for blind running that I'd never done before. So we used some trekking poles that I would hold onto the handles and I'd lift up the tips of the trekking poles so they were horizontal and we taped them to my guide's waist belt that says guide on it or pacer. This was a pacer's belt. And that, that's how we ran the entire way. It, it worked out great. In fact, it actually worked out better than the side-by-side -side method because from the motion of my guide's hips, the trekking poles actually moved like horizontal pistons. And I was able to have a natural arm swing, which I hadn't had in over about a decade of running blind from holding on to a tether with somebody who's going shoulder to shoulder with me. So it was just another example of how necessity was the mother of invention. And we, we actually did from taking something that was comfortable or, you know, something that was known and taking that away and creating something absolutely new at a point of discomfort. That's like something so simple, yet it's had such a profound impact on your experience. As you mentioned, you're now able to have that natural movement when you're running. That's phenomenal. And Aaron, you mentioned at the start, you've now had the opportunity to help others by sharing your story. Could you tell us a bit more about that? In what ways have you managed to touch other people and any stories that you can share there? Of course. 
over the last little more than a decade, uh, 12 years, I've become a bit of a case study in resilience. So, and part of that is, it's, you know, one hand washing the other. I want to learn how to become more resilient and face these difficulties so that I can teach it and share it with others. And that makes it in turn a lot more easy to face the challenges ahead. So now I have host my own podcast, Point of Impact with Aaron Hale. I'm a public speaker and I've traveled all over the country telling corporations, nonprofits, veterans groups, and telling my story of this you know, success because of struggle and triumph because of tragedy. We've got to face our fears. We've got to lean into that pain and we've got to not be afraid of failure because like I said, pain is chock full of information. If we're willing to and open or to look at it and learn from it. Oh, amazing. And have you still got other aspirations that you want to fulfill yet? Like what are some of the things that are on your mind that you want to do next? Cause I'm sure I know the answer to this, but I'd love to hear the details behind it. I'm focusing a lot on making the podcast the best it possibly can. So it means becoming a better speaker myself, becoming a better podcaster and bringing on many incredible guests that have their stories to, sh to share and teach and you know, I'm running a couple of businesses. So of course that takes a lot of my focus, but the number one is a challenge and my favorite challenge is, is being a great husband and dad. And I don't know all the answers, but I'm open and willing to learn and I hope for the challenge. Of course, when it comes to endurance races, I'm always looking for something that my first instinct is that's crazy. So there is a Himalayan race ultra marathon that runs across a few Himalayan mountain ridges. And there's something called the Coast to Cozy, which is a, I guess, 150 mile race from the Australian coast to the tallest peak in the continent. But there are, there's so many challenges out there, physical, mental, and as long as I'm learning and growing, pushing myself, I believe I'm becoming a better person for my family, for my fellow wounded veterans and everybody in general. Oh, nice. And Aaron, I've started to incorporate a new question into the podcast and I gave you a little bit of a warning right at the start. So I'm hoping you've had some time to ponder over this one. So if you could have any superpower in the world to abolish something on the planet, what would that be? I believe it would be the power to take away narcissists, which I believe is the opposite of creativity. And I think creativity is an openness. It's humility. You're open to learn. And creativity is where it's just the ability to connect pieces, connect the dots, put a puzzle together. So if you're not looking at a mirror, right? If you're not look, just thinking about yourself and you're thinking about the world as a puzzle, a challenge to put together, then I believe that if more people could do that, this world would be a far greater, a better place. Oh, I love that. And creativity is close to my heart too. So I am feeling that one 100%. Aaron, we're fast approaching time. How do people get in touch with you if they'd like to continue to follow you and follow your amazing journey? I'm at A. Clay Hale on Instagram and Facebook. And you can, of course, tune into the podcast, Point of Impact with Aaron Hale. Fantastic. And we'll include the links in the show notes as well. So folks, you don't have to remember all of that. If you're driving, you can definitely, when you park up, click on the link and check it out. And Aaron, I'm hoping to be on your podcast too. I've just got to schedule that in with you because I would love to continue our conversation and sort of continue the banter because I heard you're a bit of a fan of Indian food. And again, that's something close to my heart. So if you're ever in Birmingham in the UK, then I will definitely take you out for a curry. And I'm biased. And I will say this on air. 
I'll take you for the best curry in the UK. So oh. that's my commitment to you. That sounds fantastic. I haven't been to the UK since 2001. And I can definitely go for some real fish and chips and some good curry. I just can't find it around here. It would be my honor to have you on my show as well. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you, Aaron. And uh, yeah, now you've got a reason to build that business case to come to the UK. It's been such a pleasure. It's been so inspirational hearing your story. I've certainly become a lot wiser than I was at the start of this conversation. So thank you so much. I just love the way you have such a positive outlook and the way that you've gone through all of these challenges and not let them get in the way of your progress. And, you know, you're climbing mountains, you're talking about climbing up to the Himalayas. It's something that I don't think, you know, many people could even fathom. So yeah, well done. And thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. This was, it was an honor to be on the show and just to follow up with that. We underestimate how powerful our minds really are. It's become cliche, but it's not until we're put into or we put ourselves into extraordinary situations that we find out just how extraordinarily strong we really are. Oh, what a lovely way to finish. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you. It's the end of another episode. Thank you so much for listening please do connect with me via LinkedIn and drop me a message and let me know your favorite takeaways from the episode. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Superpower School newsletter so that you can be notified of all future episodes. Simply visit the website www.superpowers.school. Thank you once again.